Good evening and welcome to worship for Sunday night, March the 20th, 2022 here at Holcomb First Baptist Church. Um, just a couple of announcements to make. Don't forget about our weekly needs with our offerings. If you are joining us from Facebook Live or you're watching the recast and you want to uh, make an offering to our church, remember that you can drop it by 504 Griffin Avenue here in Holker or, or uh, mail it to P.O. Box 205. And as we are in the season of giving, our audiovisual fund uh, is in our bulletin this week, starting this week. We have $1,560 in this where we are planning to uh, upgrade some of our audiovisual equipment and if you wish to give to this you can mark it on your offering uh, envelope for audiovisual fund we are also in the season for the annie armstrong easter offering for north american missions our church goal is two thousand dollars and so far we have received a hundred dollars um this coming weekend on um, march the 26th our youth are doing uh, a drive-through youth supper where you will come by between five and seven and pick up your hamburger steak or chicken plate uh, also on march the 27th there will be a deacons meeting that sunday morning i was asked to make two more announcements uh, if your child is planning to go to central hills camp to please contact Lindsay. Uh, and uh, the cost for Central Hills is $65 per child. And if I remember correctly, they're going to be registering the children for uh, the Central Hills camp. They're going to be um, selling some t-shirts to help offset some of that cost. Those are set, you'll be able to see those on Facebook. And also, we're, our youth are sponsoring a church-wide yard sale, April the 23rd. We need some donations. Um, anything that you want to donate to sell at the yard sale will be great. And someone on the youth committee or youth parents can pick that up and, and uh, bring it here to the church. It can be dropped off here at the church. Any donations that would be appropriate for the yard sale. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer to open our evening worship service. Lord, I ask you to be with us tonight that we understand your word, the truths that you have for us, and that you make those things so plain to us that we know exactly how you would have us live. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship tonight is Rescue the Perishing.
continue with Speak, O Lord. for that. 
Miss Belinda, and hopefully you have made your way to 2 Peter chapter 2 as we're going to be looking at the first nine verses of 2 Peter chapter 2 tonight, dealing with adversaries of the faith. Peter begins to address the problem of false doctrine and false teachers that had crept into the churches there in Asia Minor and the area that he was writing to, the people that he was addressing. And he had just finished up there in chapter 1, dealing with the uh, sure word of prophecy. He was dealing with the truth of Scripture, and he was pointing people to the fact that they needed to still listen to the Apostles' Doctrine. They still needed to hear the Apostles' Doctrine. They still needed to heed the Apostles' Doctrine because they had been teaching the Gospel. They had been preaching the Gospel. They had been presenting the Gospel to these individuals. And it was important for them to know that teaching. It was important for them to understand those doctrines so that they would be able to fight off and to not be caught up and swept away by these false teachers, much like the nation of Israel had to deal with false prophets. And so that's kind of what we're going to get into as we move through these verses tonight. Let's start out reading the first three verses. The Bible says there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring the damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We do pray once again that you would just honor the reading and preaching of your word here tonight, dear Lord, that we would understand what Peter was warning these people about, dear Lord, and that we would see that we still must be on guard even today against these false teachings. And Lord, that you would help us to have a better understanding of your word so that we aren't led so easily astray. Dear Lord, help us to meditate upon your word, to stay plugged into your word, dear Lord, and feed on your word so that we will be strengthened, encouraged, challenged, and energized to go out and make a difference in this world around us. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Obviously, with Peter writing this, he is under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He had been getting reports of what was taking place in these areas and these churches. And so it was necessary for him to warn against false teachers. It was necessary for Peter to take time to address this situation in this particular part of the letter. Now, he is letting the people know that this is not something new, right? Uh, we understand that he is pointing out that just as the nation of Israel, and even before they were uh, formed as a nation, even in the days of Noah, there were false prophets. There were people who were telling the people what they wanted to hear, tickling their ears, all these types of things. And so, Peter is saying this is nothing new. This should not shock us. It shouldn't take us by surprise. Much like uh, the author of the book of Ecclesiastes would tell us, there's nothing new under the sun. And the preacher said there's nothing new under the sun. Peter said this is nothing new. This is not unusual. Satan is going to try to uh, refute the gospel. Satan is going to try to pervert the gospel. Satan is going to try to hinder the growth of the church. He is going to try to cause problems and chaos and confusion for, a, a, no, uh, for an undetermined amount of time for us. God knows when the end is going to be. God knows when that last day is going to come. And so we just must keep our eyes open. We must keep our hearts and minds focused on the Word of God. And if we hear something, <clears throat> excuse me, that is contrary to the Word of God, contrary to the Gospel, then we need to mark that. We need to put a red flag over it, and we need to warn others about it so that they aren't led astray, so they aren't caught off guard by 
these teachings. And so that's what he gets into. He said, there's the doctrine of the adversaries. And it is a destructive doctrine. It will destroy those who embrace it. And so he's warning them of this. He's warning us of this. That there were false prophets among the people in the days of the prophets in the nation of Israel. People like we've been talking about. Hosea and Amos and Obadiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. All those guys had to deal with false prophets. God would send them into an area and, he, and, and, and they would begin to preach what God had laid upon their heart to preach. Telling the people that they needed to turn back. That they needed to repent. That they needed to remember the covenant that they had made with God. And that they couldn't live any old way that they wanted to live and then go down to the temple and offer up their sacrifices and pray three times a day and, and that God was okay with that and he was just going to look the other way. Well, they would come in and they would preach the message that God would tell them to preach and lay upon their heart to preach. And Right after they would do that, here would come the false prophets. So Jeremiah is just trying to scare you. Ezekiel is just trying to scare you. Daniel is just trying to scare you. You can keep living how you want to live, do what you want to do, act how you want to act. There is no consequence for it. There is not going to be any eternal punishment. Told them all these things because that's what the nation of Israel wanted to hear. And much like that, there were these people, these false teachers who would come in and the preacher would faithfully preach the word and teach the word and instruct these congregations on how they need to conduct themselves and tell them about the gospel and Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, all these things. And the false teachers would come in and they were more of the self-serving type. They were building the people up and wanting them to uh, pursue the pleasures of this world and pursue the pleasures of life and do things how they wanted to do it. Certainly you can live this way and I can live that way because all roads lead to the same place. Isn't that what we hear all the time? That's not true. It's not biblical. It doesn't line up with doctrine. It doesn't line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with the gospel. He said, there are false teachers among you. And by the way there, he goes on and he said, who privily. That means secretly shall bring in damnable heresy. These guys are crafty. They're slick. It's not like they come in wearing a hat that says false teacher on them. They don't have a vest on it that has their name tag false teacher on them. Their book that they publish that you get on your Kindle or if you're like me and still like to read physical copies of the book, get it and flip through it and read it and actually turn pages, it's not going to say on there, false teacher wrote this. And so we have to be careful. We have to understand that there is a reason why we need to open our Bibles more than just on Sunday when the preacher is preaching or the Sunday school teacher is teaching. We need to open our Bibles every opportunity that we have and we need to read them and we need to study them and we need to peruse them. We need to pour over them. We need to understand what they say, why they say it, what we believe, why we believe it. So whenever these guys secretly try to get in, however way they get in, that we're ready and that we're prepared and that we know how to battle back against that. why we must be careful who we read after who we listen to on the radio who we listen to on TV and make sure that just because they are popular or have a big following or have a lot of views on YouTube or whatever it is that what they're actually is what they're actually saying lines up with scripture because they will secretly bring in damnable heresies. They will lead people astray. And here's something that these particular false teachers that Peter was addressing were doing. They were denying the Lord that bought them. They were denying that the Lord was the Messiah, that he was the promised one, that he was the one that would be slain to pay the sin debt for the world. 
They would deny his power. They would deny his authority. They would deny his word. And we're still having to deal with that today in our society. And so we must be careful that we aren't swept up in emotion and we aren't swept up with the popularity of the speaker or the author or the teacher, but make sure that they are lining up with Scripture, not simply trying to promote themselves. And he says it will bring upon them swift destruction. We have to understand the doctrine of the adversaries is a destructive doctrine. It will destroy those who embrace it, but not only will it destroy those who embrace it, but Peter is saying, regardless of what it looks like right now, it will bring upon them certain destruction. They will have to stand before God one day and give an account of how they've led people astray and what they taught and why they taught and the motive behind all those things. And they will face swift destruction. It's a destructive doctrine. It's a denying doctrine. It denies foundational truths about Christ. And so that is what he talks about here. And unfortunately, in verse 2, we see the danger. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Perhaps what should be more shocking to us than the fact that there are false teachers out there and there have always been false teachers out there and there will always continue to be false teachers is the fact that there are people who we thought were grounded in doctrine, who were grounded in the truth, who knew the scriptures, that are easily led astray by them, who quickly follow them, who share all their posts on Facebook and other forms of social media and don't realize that it only has a hint of truth in what they are saying. He said, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These false teachers will speak evil of the ones who are actually speaking the truth, who are actually teaching the truth, who are actually presenting the truth because it threatens their livelihood. It threatens their popularity. It threatens people being as readily available to listen to them and what they are saying. And what we begin to see as we get into verses 3 through 9 is the doom of the adversaries. The first part of verse 3 says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Why were they tickling the people's ears? Why were they telling them what they wanted to hear? Why were they saying what the people wanted them to say? Because it made them more money. Peter is not saying here that the preacher should not be compensated, but what he is saying is these people, what they were doing, these false teachers, was they were saying what they knew was going to make them even more money, was going to get them more speaking engagements, was going to help them become more popular and have best-selling books and all these types of things. They weren't concerned with teaching the truth. They weren't concerned with preaching the truth. They really didn't have the, be the people's uh, best interests in mind. They were simply serving themselves, promoting themselves rather than preaching the gospel. And he goes on and he says in the second part of verse 3, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. There is the nearness of their doom seen there. It is sure. They are heaping upon themselves sure and swift and certain judgment. And it seems as if they don't care. They are openly doing it. They are willingly doing it. Even though they are being very crafty and cunning in how they present it and how they introduce it into the church. Ultimately, they know what they are doing and they know 
how to do it. And God said, I'm watching it all. Jesus said, their destruction is imminent. Their doom is near. It is sure. So it may appear that they are going to gain popularity for a season. It may appear that they have figured out how to exploit the people and make money off of the people and gain popularity off of the people. But when that day comes, it will be a swift and sure time of destruction. They will face the judgment. They will be paying the ultimate price for perverting the gospel and trying to benefit from it. And Peter gives us three examples here to look at in verses 4 through 9 because their doom is near. And what you see in verses 4 through 9 is the nature of that doom. He gives three examples from the Old Testament of this. In verse 4 he said, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So, Peter is painting a very poignant picture for us, right? He is letting us know that no matter how high we think we may be, if we do not return to Christ or if we do not repent and turn to Christ, what the consequences will be. And for these false teachers who were leading people astray and who were causing problems and wreaking havoc, they were going to be much like the fallen angels from the Old Testament who decided to side with Lucifer and were cast out of heaven. And for a time period there in the book of Genesis, they were causing confusion. They were causing chaos. They were wreaking havoc. Now we know some of those angels were already bound. Some for a time period like these were loosed and they were the ones who were causing chaos and confusion and now they're bound. And Peter said, there's an example right there. They were already in heaven. They were angels. They were created to serve God. They were created to worship God. And because of their sin, they were cast down to hell. They were delivered into chains of darkness. It's a picture of judgment. The sure and swift nearness of doom. It's why we should be preaching the gospel. It's why we should be concerned about those who have perverted the gospel and who have twisted the gospel and made the gospel say what they wanted to say because there are people just like these false teachers who are on a road that leads to swift and sure destruction unless they repent and turn to Christ as their Savior. They will be in a place of darkness chained and bound facing the judgment. It is severe. He gives another example in verse 5. He said not only were the angels that sin cast down in hell delivered unto chains of darkness, but in verse 5 he said and spared not the old world. Talking about during the days of Noah. That's why he said, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Here's what we begin to see happen, right? Here's what's taking place. Those angels that had been wreaking havoc and causing confusion for 120 years, Noah built the ark. And he preached the same message for 120 years. Judgment's coming. It's going to be sure. It's going to be swift. It's going to take place. It is happening. Doom is sure. 
The only way that you will be saved from this destruction is to enter into the ark. To believe what I'm saying. It's the only place of protection. It is the picture of what we see today through what Jesus did for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. That's what he told the disciples. And so for 120 years, Noah preaches that message. Preaches that message while he's building the ark. Action sermon right there. He's building the ark. Why are you building the ark? What is this thing? He gave him an opportunity to explain why he was doing it, what he had been told to do, how he had been instructed to do it. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about, Noah. What's, what's water? What's rain? What's a flood? They didn't listen to him. They kept on living how they wanted to live, doing what they wanted to do. That preacher's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So the first drop of rain fell. <clears throat> that preacher reminded me what he was talking about. By then it was too late. They had rejected the message. They had rejected the messenger. They were now going to face the sure, certain, swift doom and destruction that came from them refusing to listen to the truth of the gospel. And the flood came upon the world of the ungodly, and except for Noah and his family, no one was spared. He gives one more example in verse 6. And he said, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. We know what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. We know of the lifestyles that were being lived there. We know why destruction came upon them. This was a society that had completely disregarded God. They were living immoral lifestyles. They had been turned over to that immoral lifestyle because of their refusal to repent and return to God. And even though... There had been intervention made on their behalf. If you find just one righteous person there. But what we find is that only Lot was delivered. For those who live an ungodly lifestyle. And openly live in that sin and do not return and refuse to repent, refuse to listen to the gospel. They condemn themselves to a life of swift and sure punishment, darkness, destruction, devastation, and eternity spent in hell. Should we be defending the gospel? Yes. Should we know what the gospel says and why we believe what we believe? Yes. So that we can warn others of this sure and swift destruction that will come upon them if they do not repent. If they do not turn to Christ. You know, the thing that we hear so many times as Christians, and the thing that gives the pastor more gray hairs is why aren't our churches full like they used to be in our country today? But I would have another question. Not only why are our churches not full, but why aren't our altars full? We know people who are dead in their trespasses and sin. We know people that if they die tonight would spend the eternity separated from the love of Jesus Christ. They are facing a sure, swift, certain time of destruction and damnation, and we seem to not care by the way we act. Not only have we been forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but we have forsaken the privilege of meeting in an altar and praying for that person together with fellow believers, lifting their name up 
and praying that they will repent. We should be thankful for our prayer warriors. We should be thankful for those who enter into the closet of prayer and we should be entering into that closet with them. In verse 7, he said he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. What you see here is that Lot had been surrounded by this wickedness, by these people who were living this lifestyle and it was completely overwhelming him up to the point that he was delivered. In verse 8 he said, For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Where are our broken hearts for those who are lost? Where are our broken hearts for those who are on a path that leads to damnation and destruction? Where are our broken hearts for those who have been deceived by the things of the world and enticed by false teachers? He closes out the first section of this particular chapter of this letter in verse 9. In letting us know that in the nature of the doom, not only is it severe, but it is sanctified. Because Peter says the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Why do we pray for others? Why do we intercede for others? Why do we go to God on their behalf? Because the Lord knows how to deliver them out of temptation. He knows how to deliver us out of temptation. And then he goes on and says, and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Remember the sons of thunder were real quick to try to call down thunder and lightning and destruction on those who would make fun of Jesus and some of the things that he was saying and teaching. And he Kind of had to call them off, right? He had to calm them down a little bit there. And so what he is trying to get us to see here is, yes, we should recognize false prophets and teachers. Yes, we should speak out against false prophets and teachers and what they are teaching. And we should recognize that what they're teaching can lead others astray and can cause chaos and confusion. But it's not up to us to dole out the punishment. It may seem for a while that they're being successful. It may seem for a while that nothing is going to take place. But there is that day of judgment that will take place for those who have perverted the gospel. For those who have led people astray by denying the Lord and His power and His might and what He did for us at Calvary. Ultimately, Peter says the adversaries of the faith deserve the swift and sure Destruction and doom that they will encounter and face because of the evil that they do in sending other souls to destruction. That's why we defend the gospel. That's why we know what we believe and why we believe it and refute what they are teaching and refute what they say because there are people who are listening to them and will be led into destruction themselves if we don't intercede and pray and fight for them. Why are we fighting for lost souls? Why are we fighting to defend the gospel? We can fight over all kinds of other things. We can get into all kinds of fights and debates on social media. On things that doesn't matter to anything that has to do with eternity. But we're not fighting for the lost. We're not interceding for those who are on a path that leads to destruction. So as we close out tonight, we must understand that doom is sure. Devastation is coming. There is a day appointed unto man for which he will die, and then he will face the judgment. Are we prepared? Are we ready? And if we know someone who's not, will we go fight for them? 
when we intercede for them, when we enter into our prayer closets for them. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now.